This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Thursday, the 13th of January, 2022. The First Punic War has passed. Rome and Carthage have fought and tested each other's metal. Rome, against all odds, was able to improvise, adapt, and overcome to develop a navy with the power to fight Carthage. Now, copying Carthaginian ships wasn't enough. Rome also had to find a way to compensate for Carthage's strength at naval battle. And what they came up with was the Corvus, which is the big swiveling ramp on the front of their vessels, where the Romans would row up to the enemy and instead of trying to ram them or destroy them with arrow fire or catapult fire, simply drop the Corvus onto the Carthaginian deck, send Roman marines across the ramp, and turn sea battles into land battles. This won for Rome, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. But the battle was not over yet. Hamilcar Barca, the leading Carthaginian general, had sworn revenge. And if he wasn't going to fill it out, his sons would. Now, the Second Punic War is a lot like the Second World War. It follows up a preliminary conflict that was very destructive, and many of the same issues are going to be fought over and decided that were left unresolved by a result of the First Punic War. After the First Punic War, the territories had shifted a little bit. Carthage had lost Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica to Rome. And Rome controlled all of this also. And up into Cisalpine Gaul. To compensate, Carthage moved up into Iberia, what today we would call Spain and Portugal. And Carthage conquers or brings into alliance the many Celt-Iberian tribes that reside in this area. Because this is Carthage's most important venture after the defeat in the First Punic War, they give the colonies in Iberia to their greatest general, Hamilcar Barca. Now, Carthage's troops and Rome's troops were fundamentally different. The Carthaginians saw themselves as seafarers and merchants and governors and administrators and thinkers and not foot soldiers. Carthage had money, Carthage needed soldiers, so Carthage hires mercenaries. <coughs> mercenaries are soldiers for hire. And mercenaries bring to their jobs a superior skill to most other types of soldiers. After all, if a mercenary is good enough at war to get paid for it, he's got to have something superior to the average soldier. But, even though mercenaries often have a, a niche market skill, their job is to survive for their payday. Mercenaries are not there to fight hopeless battles. They are not there to fight for the death or to the death. Mercenaries will fight until it's clear how the battle's going to go. And then being paid, they stop. They stop fighting when it's unreasonable to fight anymore. They're there not to win a cause or, or preserve a nation. They're there to earn money. And money is useless if you're dead. 
so the Carthages, the Carthaginian soldiers often were very skilled, but they would fight until the point it was unreasonable to keep fighting, and then they would stop. There were a few Carthaginian units, but not many. The Carthaginians tended to command the mercenaries. That, that's, that's their army. Rome's army was composed of citizen soldiers. Citizen soldiers are family farmers, craftsmen, all sorts of plebeians in the ranks. with patrician officers. They are not there to earn a paycheck. They have to provide their own weapons and armor. They are there to do their patriotic duty. They're also really skilled military engineers. We talked about this. So, Rome's soldiers might or might not be exactly as skilled in every art of battle as the Carthaginian mercenaries. That's a question of unit by unit, because Carthage's mercenaries were darn good at what they did. The Roman soldiers were darn good at what they did. Lots of darn good going on. But when the battle turned against them, Romans would keep fighting because they weren't fighting to live to earn a paycheck. They were fighting for their patria, for their fatherland. They were fighting for Rome, for their wives, for their children, for their businesses, for their slaves. They were fighting for their lives. And this brings a supreme dedication to Rome's citizen soldiers that Carthage is going to be hard pressed to match. Now, Hamilcar raises his boys, Hasdrubal <coughs> and Hannibal, as vengeance weapons against Rome. <coughs> Their father was not interested in them growing up to be what they want to be. No. Their destiny is to learn the arts of war and to learn about Rome, their enemy, and to learn how to command men in battle. And like Alexander the Great before them, Hamilcar Barker's boys, as young teenagers, command units on the battlefield. They see death firsthand, they order men to go die, so that victory can be achieved. They learn how to inspire men. They learn the subtleties of battle. They learn all of this from their father before he dies. They are raised to be the vengeance of Carthage, to avenge its defeat, and to bring Rome to its knees. The Second Punic War begins for the same reason that the first. Rome and Carthage have recovered. Rome has the islands, Carthage has Iberia. Time for round two. The exact pretext of the war really doesn't matter. So, Rome expects Carthage to do what Carthage is good at, a naval and amphibious campaign to try to retake the islands. And so Rome's entire strategy is to empty Italy to strengthen the island garrisons. However, Hannibal is going to do the unexpected. Hannibal is going to mass his army in Iberia cross the Pyrenees into southern Gaul, make his way by bribing the tribesmen <coughs> of southern Gaul to the Alps. Now, there are coastal roads and passages south of the Alps, between the Alps and the Azure coast of the Mediterranean Sea. That's true. The Romans guard that very carefully. 
But to the Romans, it is inconceivable that an army could be brought across the high Alps. It is a barrier like having a hundred foot high laser fence topped by sharks with freaking lasers on their heads. It is not expected, it, it, it's not passable. The Romans see it basically as a wall. However, Hannibal has bribed tribesmen who live in these mountains. And they guide Hannibal's army through the Alps. Now, this is not an easy experience. The Alps are a strainer of death. You know what a strainer is. It's also called a colander. It's used in the kitchen for cooking. You make some noodles, some pasta, some spaghetti in a big pot of boiling water. How do you get the water out? Well, you dump the spaghetti into a colander or a strainer. The spaghetti stays in the colander. The water flows through the holes or through the netting out into the sink and gone. The spaghetti is left. The water is gone. Tra-la. All done. Hannibal's army goes into the Alps with a force of war elephants. War elephants are like ancient tanks. You don't want a North... I mean, North African elephants are not the same as modern African elephants. They're maybe even a little smaller than the today's Indian elephants or Asian elephants. But they're still big. To a human being, they're huge. And when an elephant is trained to war, as the North African elephants of Carthage were, they'll just stomp you. <laughs> they'll go right through you. I'm here with my shield against an elephant? Ah! Not a good day. All the elephants die. Didn't one live? Maybe one. I don't know, symbolically. <laughs> but as a force. <laughs> the, what's his name? Stompy? I don't know. <laughs> I lose! <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> I've been done seeing about everything. So, uh, it's a Dumbo reference. <laughs> I like Horton here, so it was my favorite story as a child. Even beating out where the wild things are. Which is a wonderful, wonderful story. Lousy movie, wonderful story. So, the elephants are dead as a force, as they all be one. Um, and Hannibal's siege train, his siege engines are also destroyed, and a lot of his engineers are killed. This is going to be important later. The elephants are gone, the engineers are gone, the siege engines are gone. But what does come over the Alps are his infantry and his cavalry into the vales south of the Alps where nobody expects an enemy army to be. The Romans in Cisalpine Gaul gather up a force. In panic, they strike at Hannibal and they're defeated. A second fourth, fourth, a second fourth, a second force goes north to Lake Tresemane and tries to defeat Hannibal as he's approaching Rome. And they get clocked. So the Romans have panicked at this point. He's coming! He's coming! There's Hannibal coming, and they have nothing. Both their armies are destroyed. So they quickly pull forces back from the islands. They recruit a new army in Rome, and suddenly they have an army of 80,000 plus Romans. This is much larger than Hannibal's force. Hannibal's force ends up shifting to the east side of the Apennines and is marching south. And the Romans are going to meet Hannibal here at a place called Cannae. Cannae is a big battle. It's one of the two big battles of the Second Punic War. Battle of Cannae. And i show you... I didn't bring out the video control. I'm going to show you a video, or maybe a couple, that deal with this key turning point battle. Thanks, Dan. You were right. I, I was going to ask you.
is part of it. And we'll pause it. Battle. Um, the battle of the pack. I'm married, I'm married. I think it's in that they, ah, yes. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. the drawing the enemy in. Excellent, excellent. I forgot. Silly me. Um, yeah, the Romans were power mad. And what I mean by power mad or power blind, both terms are used. They had, I think, 86,000 troops. The Carthys had a third of what they had. The, the Romans just assumed that they were an unstoppable hammer. And so they basically made a giant big formation that moved forward. The cavalry protected their flanks. But Hannibal understood the psychology of the Romans. He understood that they assumed that they'll kill anything that they march towards. He also understood that they wouldn't do so. When you have a disadvantage in manpower, then you have to be so. But when you have an advantage, excuse me, when you have an advantage in manpower, you can just <coughs> smash your enemy with main force. And that's what the Romans would do. So, yes, like the Persians at Marathon, the Romans just became this force moving forward, inexorably forward. Hannibal draws them in to a trap. His cavalry strips the Romans of their cavalry on the sides. His elite infantry waits as the Romans walk into the trap. His elite infantry then hits from the sides. His uh, main infantry holds in front. The Romans are shocked. And then the cavalry hits them from behind, and they're in a box, being eaten from all sides. Now... Had the Romans had a commander in their midst, or some modern technology that would allow a signal for all of them, they might have changed this. If all of them had turned as one in a single direction, other than the forward that they had been going, and if they had all fought to one purpose, they might have achieved some degree of something. But by this point, the Roman legions were not an army anymore. They were a mob. I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd of people to the point where it's claustrophobic. I have. It's very unpleasant. You're surrounded by this mass of people, and you're being buffeted by them, and you're being moved by them, and it's like you have no choice. You're like a fly or like, like an animal that falls into a river. The river is pushing you downstream. And you can swim and swim, but for a while you're going downstream where the river goes. Kane is Hannibal's greatest victory. Because his forces remain disciplined and they just kill and kill and kill and kill and kill until they get to the center of this great Roman mass of men who've lost the spirit to fight, who've lost unit cohesion, who've lost the ability to function as a group. The greatest Roman strength isn't just numbers. It's turning units of men into more than the sum of their parts, and all of that goes away. They're a mob of men being slaughtered. It's a murder more than a battle at the end. So now Hannibal has defeated all the Roman armies in Italy, and what he expects is he's going to win. The Italians can't like the Romans very much. The Romans conquered them. And while he might not have many siege engines and engineers, people who are good at defeating city walls, certainly people in Italy do. But here's where a great disappointment for Hannibal occurs. Most of the Italians remain loyal to Rome. They do not join with Hannibal. Rome is not the Athenian Empire. Rome is durable. The allies of Rome stick with Rome, even when Hannibal has the superior army. They remain loyal. They don't supply Hannibal's troops. They don't supply him with siege engines. They don't do what Hannibal needs them to do to win final victory, because the walls of Rome are going to be proof against Hannibal's attacks. 
without significant Italian help, without significant Italian engineers, those city walls might as well be a giant 100-foot laser fence with sharks with bleeping lasers. Because Hannibal's not getting across. For 14 years, it's most of your lifetime, Hannibal marches up and down Italy. Anyone stupid enough to get in range is destroyed. The Romans learn not to confront him directly. But he can't win. He doesn't have the Italians. He doesn't have the siege engines. Meanwhile, the Romans have a new commander named Scipio. And Scipio goes to Spain, goes to Iberia. And in Iberia, Scipio conquers the remnant Carthaginians that Hannibal left behind. In Iberia, and this is sort of a hint of the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon's wars later, in Iberia, Scipio learns to fight Hannibal's tactics. He learns to fight Hannibal's people. He has time to make mistakes and to figure out solutions to each of the mistakes. Scipio takes Iberia for Rome. And now it's time. Rome has a new army. It's going to join with Scipio's <coughs> army. And it's not going to fight Hannibal in Italy. No. It's going to land near Carthage and take Carthage. Hannibal will be a man without a country. His army will no longer have a purpose. When the Carthaginian Senate, they have a Senate too, sees the Roman legions landing, they send an emergency delegation to Hannibal in Italy saying, You! Come home now! Take command of our forces here. Hannibal has no choice. He leaves the remnant of his veteran army in Italy to its fate. And he goes back to Carthage and takes personal command. His army in Carthage is fresh, it's new. And the heart of its power are war elephants. Once again, Hannibal has that specially Carthaginian weapon, the war elephant. Scipio versus Hannibal at Zema, a plain east of Carthage. The Carthaginian plan is to send the war elephants into the Roman lines, shattering them, destroying their morale, destroying their discipline, destroying their unit cohesion. And after the element elephants smash and turn the Romans into human jelly, then the Carthaginian infantry will hit the Romans and destroy them. That's his basic plan. Scipio knows. And his men have been trained in a special maneuver. <coughs> Here they are. The elephants, each of them, are charging ahead. The men realize who's directly in front of the elef elements. Elements. They're hundreds. The elephants. And a command is given. Part ways! And the Romans... Separate at those points, creating aisles. Now, the elephants can't turn on a dime. They can't turn around. They can't really change course because there's so much momentum. <laughs> they go through, that's what they did. They go through the aisles created by Scipio's army, killing very few because Scipio's army got out the way. It takes the element, elephants 15 minutes to slow down, turn around, and reorganize. But during those critical 15 minutes, Scipio closes ranks, orders the attack, and by the time the, element, the elephants are ready to hit again, Scipio's army is grappling in melee combat with the Carthaginians. If the elephants go in, they'll kill their own men. So the elephants are nullified. Scipio's force defeats Hannibal's force. Carthage surrenders. Hannibal goes into exile. Rome wins the Second Punic War. 
And Scipio is given the name <coughs> Africanus, conqueror of Africa, as a reward. The greatest of the Punic Wars has been won. However, Hannibal's not done. Hannibal spends the rest of his life traveling around the Greek and Macedonian world in the East, going from royal court to royal court, begging the local kings to join him in an anti-Roman pact. To his dying day, he is an implacable enemy of Rome. Romans assassinate him. He's gone. Bye-bye, Hannibal. Now, this is important because the Romans, for 14 years, had to put up with this guy in Italy. And for hundreds of years thereafter, Roman mothers would say to disobedient children, Be good, or Hannibal will get you. Oh, no, Mommy, don't be no, no, I'll be good. Because he was their boogeyman. Truth. Then there's a period of peace. But to get this, when they surrendered, Carthage gave up all of its colonies. It also gave up the area of Africa west of Carthage between Carthage and Mauritania called Numidia. Hannibal gave up his, its navy. I'm sorry, Carthage gave up its navy, and they gave up most of their army. Carthage was now the town and the area directly around the town, and that's all. Moreover, Carthage swears never to go to war without Rome's permission. Never to go to war without Rome's permission. Even though this is the case, the great Roman senator, Marcus Porcius Cato the Elder, one of the greatest, most traditional Romans ever, a senator of the patrician class, saw Carthage as an existential permanent threat. So long as Carthage exists, Rome will be imperiled. So, when Cato spoke in the Senate, whether it's about fixing the sewers, or whether it's about building a new aqueduct, or whether it's about having some funeral games, Whatever he was talking about, Cato, Marcus Porcius Cato, the elder, would conclude every one of his speeches with the words, Cartago de Linda Est. Cartago de Linda Est. Carthage must be destroyed. In English, the whole phrase would be, and in addition to what my remarks just said, I maintain that Carthage must be destroyed. Cartago de Linda Est. He, for decades, harps on the need to destroy Carthage. But nobody listens. Carthage is beaten. Rome is expanding in every direction. However, the king of Numidia, Carthage's former ally, sees an opportunity in Carthage's weakness. And Numidians start raiding Carthaginian estates in the countryside. They start raping Carthaginian wo mur women, murdering Carthaginian men, taking Carthaginian children as slaves. And the Carthaginians don't have the forces to fight them off. 
They protest to Numidia. And the king says, these are bandits. I can't control them. Because, <laughs> of course, he can. He just doesn't want to. In fact, he has ordered these attacks. Carthage is dealing with a king who's acting like an enemy now, who's waging a low-grade war against his people, its people. So the Carthaginian Senate sends a delegation to Rome's Senate. The delegation's purpose is to get Rome to either stop Numidia, because Rome is Numidia's ally, or to allow Carthage to wage war on Numidia in self-defense. The senators keep the Carthaginians waiting. In the lobby, in their hotel, day after day, week after week, month after month. Oh, sorry, we can't see you today. It becomes clear that Rome is playing a game with Carthage too. That they have no interest in helping the Carthaginians protect themselves against the Numidians. They kind of like it. Carthage can't protect itself. Carthage is being victimized. Stinks to be you, don't it? So the Carthaginian delegation returns home and says to the Senate, it's hopeless. Rome won't let us <coughs> to declare war. If we're going to go out, let's go out with a bang, not a whimper. If we're going to die, let's die like men on our feet, not on our knees. Our knees. Carthage goes to war with Numidia. Rome responds with overwhelming force. The great-grandson of Scipio Africanus, Scipio Aemilianus, goes with the historian Polybius, and a massive Roman force that lands around Carthage. The Numidians and the Romans take Carthage's lands. The city of Carthage is besieged. And after a couple of years of siege, the Romans break through, and Carthago est delenda. Carthage is destroyed. I, I, I don't speak Latin. So. But that's not all. The Romans enslave the people, they, they kill a bunch of them, they make the rest slaves. But in order to make sure that Carthage is never a threat again, the Romans salt the soil with plows. They sow salt into the croplands and orchards around Carthage, poisoning the land. They poison the wells. They make it impossible for the old city of Carthage to be inhabited by anyone. This is an act of spite. The Romans are capable of great spite. By salting the earth and poisoning the wells, Rome destroys Carthage. Cato's dream, Carthago de Linda Est, comes true. But here's the ironic part. Rome is now ruler of all the western Mediterranean and it's marching east. But they realize they need a city somewhere near here to control this region. So a couple miles down the coast, the Romans build a new Carthage. At first they call it Novo Carthago or New Carthage, and then they just call it Carthage. So the Romans destroy Carthage in the Third Punic War, and then they rebuild their own Carthage a century later. And it's this new Carthage that exists throughout the late Republic and the Roman Empire, and is finally conquered by the Vandals at the fall of Rome. Irony can be pretty ironic sometimes. The Punic Wars are like World War II in this sense. This is a true story. My wife's mom and dad were old when they had her. They're World War II generation. My wife's dad knew guys who were killed at Pearl Harbor personally. He was in the Navy uh, program to train naval officers when he was in college. He was going to command a landing craft in Operations Olympic and Downfall, the invasion of Japan. My mother-in-law was a Navy nurse, and she was going to be on a hospital ship off the coast. 
Both of them probably would have been uh, killed or wounded by kamikazes or Japanese soldiers. They were both saved by the atom bomb. But at the beginning of America's involvement in World War II, my wife's mom was a high school student. And they lived in coastal Massachusetts. Her birthday is the day after Christmas, December 26th. And December 26th, 1941, the month of Pearl Harbor, the month when the Japanese seem to be advancing everywhere in the Pacific and the Germans start sinking ships off the coast of the United States within eyesight of the coast. She asked her father for a present and he gave it to her. She was worried and upset and her father, who was a World War I combat veteran, said, don't worry, Lizzie. I will never let you be captured alive by any enemy soldier. And she thanked him. Now, what he was promising her, what they both understood, was that if the Germans landed in Massachusetts, he, before going out to fight them, would kill his own daughter and his own wife with his own hands so that they would not be brutalized by the enemy. And she was grateful. This is almost impossible to understand because Americans today can't imagine losing a war. We can't imagine being conquered. The last time most Americans thought it was possible for us to be conquered was early in World War II. The last time Rome is afraid of being conquered for almost half a millennium, for about 500 years, the last time Rome is really afraid of losing a war forever is when Hannibal is marching past Rome again and again for those 14 years in Italy. The Second Punic War is a turning point in that after that, Rome is going to be mistress of the seas and of the lands for many hundreds of years. The Third Punic War is an afterthought, an act of spite, an act of destruction that the Romans later have to rebuild. The city is just funny in a sick sort of way. So tomorrow you will have a quiz on everything we have done about Rome. It will be extensive. I think there are 80 or 90 questions. Tomorrow you will also get a study guide for your exam. I decided that I would give it. The study guide does not include what we covered today and at the end of class yesterday about the Punic Wars. Hannibal, Kane, Zama, and so forth. So you may want to make sure to study today's notes, all the notes on the Punic Wars in addition to the study guide. Any questions? Uh, you can talk quietly amongst yourselves. Thank you for your attention.